Hello, and welcome to our online series of Professional Investor's Guide to Crypto Assets, and special thanks to our webinar sponsor, Bitwise Asset Management. A couple of programming notes for the society. We'd like for you to join us for our next online series, Capitalizing on Uncertainty, the value advantage in non-US and emerging markets on May 25th from 12 to 1, and our upcoming annual meeting, a conversation with BlackRock's IHUB team on June 16th from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Please register today on our website and look for further details. And for all our members, please remember to cast your vote on our annual proxy. And while logged in, please participate in our annual member survey. Thanks so much. And today we are joined by Matt Hogan, one of the world's leading experts on crypto, ETFs, and financial technology. He is Chief Investment Officer for Bitwise Asset Management, a pioneer in crypto asset index funds. Please submit your questions to Matt via the Q&A feature within the Zoom controls at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'll pass it over to Matt Hogan. Thanks so much. And thanks everyone for making time to chat today. I'm really excited to discuss Bitcoin, blockchain, and crypto uh, and provide my view on, on what they are, uh, what they aren't, why they're exciting, why they're not exciting. I think this is one of the most talked about areas of the market. It's also one of the places with the lowest quality of information. There's a lot of hype around Bitcoin, blockchain, and crypto, a lot of poor information. And I'm going to try to give you uh, my view about why this is exciting, as well as some of the risks and where it might fit in a portfolio setting. So the agenda today, just to run through what we're going to talk about, going to open up by talking a little bit about who is Bitwise, going to spend two or three minutes on that, just so you know where we're coming from. Then going to pivot to discuss some very basic information about what crypto is and why it matters. I'm going to try to arm you with a way to understand and discuss crypto with your friends to really get what a blockchain is, why it's interesting, what its limitations are. We're then going to talk about why there is more than one crypto asset. I think people get a lot confused sometimes why there are 9,000 different crypto assets. How do you decide which ones are interesting? I want to provide you a framework for making that decision. Then we're going to talk about crypto's role in a portfolio, maybe a few minutes about what's going on in the market right now, and then we'll save lots of time for Q&A. Uh, my favorite part of these presentations is always the questions, and it works best if you don't hold back. Ask me the hard questions, the questions that are stuck in the back of your mind, and we'll answer as many of them as we can by the end of the session. But let's start Briefly, with a, a, a brief overview about Bitwise, this isn't a Bitwise commercial, but I want you to know where we're coming from. Bitwise is one of the largest, fastest growing, and most established crypto asset managers in the US. We were founded in 2017. We're best known for having created the world's first crypto index fund, the Bitwise 10. Some people call it the S&P 500 of crypto. Uh, we manage about $1.5 billion in assets across our fund family. And we're well known in the market really for two things. One, for core education. Uh, this webinar is an example. Uh, you know, I, I was able to co-author with a colleague of mine, the CFA Institute's first ever guide to Bitcoin, blockchain, and crypto, which, which I hope you all have. Uh, and secondly, that we're focused exclusively on the financial advisor and financial professional market. Uh, a lot of crypto goes after the retail market. Some of crypto goes after sort of the endowment foundation market. We're one of the only firms that are built primarily to serve financial advisors, family offices, multifamily offices, and other financial intermediaries. So that's where we're coming from. We're 25 people today growing quickly. Uh, I think we'll be 40 or 45 by the end of the quarter. Uh, I won't go through uh, our, our executive bios in depth, uh, except to mention uh, a moment about my own. I come from a deep ETF background. I know you might have been expecting uh, a guy with a hoodie. Uh, I'm more of a button down shirt guy. Uh, our team spans sort of experience in tech from firms like Google and Facebook with experience in asset management. I certainly come from the, from the asset management side of that, that equation, uh, having been the CEO of ETF.com and, and part of the Barron's ETF roundtable and those sorts of things. 
uh, some of our educational materials you can find on our website, bitwiseinvestments.com. We try to provide information that helps you speak to your clients, your colleagues, your friends, your family, uh, and, and in a way that contextualizes what crypto is. And here's the fun family. Won't go through each one, uh, but just, just briefly, the Bitwise 10 is our, our large cap crypto index fund. We also have a sector fund covering decentralized finance, one of the most exciting corners of the market. And over on the, the blue, actually an exciting day today, uh, today on the New York Stock Exchange, we listed our first ETF, which is a crypto equity ETF. It doesn't hold crypto assets like Bitcoin. It holds companies in the crypto space like Coinbase, which offers a alternative, more mainstream way to access the crypto economy. Uh, happy to answer questions about that or any of the products once we get to the Q&A. But before we get to how would you invest in this space? I wanna back up and answer this very basic question. What is crypto and why does it matter? You know, crypto is covered breathlessly in the financial media. It's on the front pages of magazines. People talk about Bitcoin this and Dogecoin that and Ethereum. They talk about crypto changing the world. Some people talk about it as rat poison squared. That was Warren Buffett's term for that. But the reality is I think most people don't understand what it is. They think it is this internet currency that was created on a spreadsheet by someone we don't know and fell from the sky and today is worth $2 trillion. Uh, they talk about it solving the world, but they don't know why. And so I wanna back up and provide some sort of foundational information about what crypto is and why it matters. And we'll start with this. A lot of people think of Bitcoin, and we use Bitcoin because it's the most well-known, largest crypto asset. A lot of people think of Bitcoin the way they think of dollars. And they expect to use Bitcoin in the same way that they use dollars, which means they expect to go to Starbucks and buy their mocha frappuccinos with Bitcoin. And I'm here to tell you that it'll be a long time to never before you're buying your mocha frappuccinos with Bitcoin. You're certainly not doing it now. You're not going to be doing it next year, and you're unlikely to be doing it in three to five years from now. And I think a lot of people are skeptical about crypto because they conceive of it as a currency and they don't see themselves using it in their day-to-day -day lives the same way they use dollars. But I wanna tell you that both Bitcoin and crypto is extremely interesting. I think a once in a generation technological breakthrough and that even me living in the Bay Area of California has never bought a coffee with Bitcoin. Both of those things can be true. I want you to stop thinking about Bitcoin as a currency and start thinking about it as a technology that moves money into the internet era. You know, one of the weird things about money, and I don't think people think about this enough, is it's one of the slowest moving, moving items in our world today. We could have a webinar where I talk to you all in Atlanta from my home here in Berkeley. Uh, I can open up my phone and watch any movie that's ever been created. I can do a free video call with someone in Kuala Lumpur, but if I wanna send someone money, it takes forever. Uh, my colleague, Alec, uh, who covers the Southeast, if I wanted to send him a check for $5,000, I would log into my Wells Fargo account, send a check to Alec. It would go through the US Postal Service. In five days or so, Alec would get the check. He would deposit it at his bank, before Alec could withdraw that money, his bank would have to check with my bank to make sure I had $5,000, that I hadn't written 10 checks on the same $5,000 deposit, that there weren't any blocks on my account. And three or so days later, Alec could withdraw the money. That diagram of how money moves to the financial system is shown on the left of this slide. You can see it goes from me to my bank, to Alec's bank, and then eventually to Alec. It takes an extremely long amount of time. One way to think about what crypto does, one way to easily conceptualize it is that it allows money to move like the internet. When I send you a text or I send you an email, it just goes directly to you. It's a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. And that's what you see on the right side of this uh, equation. So if you wanna contextualize in a very simple fashion what crypto does, it allows me to send money over the internet in the same way that I would send a text or an email. Now I can't see you all, but if I were seeing you in person, you'd all be looking at me skeptically and you say, Matt, I can already do that. I have Venmo on my phone. 
Uh, the other day I paid my babysitter in Venmo or I split a check with friends with Venmo uh, or I sent them a few dollars using PayPal. And the thing about Venmo is it actually provides the perfect analogy for understanding what a blockchain is. If you've heard about blockchain for the past five years, but you couldn't explain it to your uncle or your cousin or your children, here's the, here's the moment that I think it will lock in. The reason Venmo is one of the most downloaded apps in the world, the reason it's on the phone of 200 million Americans in the US is because it allows us to move money faster than the traditional financial system. Whereas that check moving from my bank to Alex bank with verification takes a bunch of time. With Venmo, I can send Alec money instantaneously. And some people wonder why Venmo is so fast and traditional banks are so slow. And this diagram provides that answer. The reason Venmo is so fast is it's one database. So inside Venmo, I can only send money to another Venmo customer. If I wanna send that money, Venmo can look to make sure my account has the money I wanna send. They control every transaction so they know I haven't tried to send, say if I have $1,000 in my account, I haven't tried to send it to seven different people. And because they control the database, they can move money between me and anyone, any other Venmo client as fast as you can change uh, the one line in an Excel document, they can move it instantaneously. The reason traditional banking system is slow is because it's thousands of databases. And before they can move money between them, they have to verify the status of the account at their counterparty bank. And so the, the, the short answer for why Venmo exists is one database is faster than thousands of databases. And this has made Venmo you know, a multi-billion dollar uh, entity. And as I mentioned, one of the, the most used apps in the world. The whole key to understanding what a blockchain is, the whole key to understanding what crypto is, is it is the first database that's a single database that can be available everywhere in the world that everyone can see, that everyone in the world agrees on the state of that database, but which isn't controlled by a single third party. So Venmo is one database that's available for Venmo customers through the Venmo app and Venmo controls that database. And if you want to put a million dollars in your Venmo account, you're subject to the, the risk and liability of Venmo. And if they want to charge you fees, they can do that. All a blockchain is, and the Bitcoin blockchain was the first one, is one database like Venmo, except it's available everywhere, open to everyone like the internet. It's the first database that's available everywhere in the world open to everyone, where everyone agrees on the state of that database, but where no single third party controls it. It was a major computer science breakthrough to figure out how to have such a database in the world. And the Bitcoin blockchain was the first one and all subsequent crypto blockchains follow in that pattern. Now you may be asking, why does that matter, Matt? Why does it matter that we can have one database that's available everywhere around the world? Why is that? created this ecosystem called crypto that's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And the reason is it does three things that we've never been able to do before. And one of them, the least interesting one, but one of them is the ability to move money over the internet, the ability for money to be native over the internet. And this isn't a, a, a theoretical benefit. Let me make it very concrete. If you go to Bank of America's homepage right now, and you look up their international wire transfer page, on that page, the page advertising Bank of America service, they tell you that it takes one to two business days to move money abroad, and the fee is between one and 4%. So if I were to send $10,000 to London today, the earliest it could get there is Friday, and the fee would be one to 4%. By comparison, on the Bitcoin blockchain the other day, someone moved $1.1 billion dollars it settled in 10 minutes and the fee was 57 cents. Now I wanna pause for a moment to think about that. On the one hand, you have one of the largest banks in the world, 240,000 employees, offices in 38 countries, a $4 trillion balance sheet, a high paid CEO, and it takes them two days to move money to London. On the other hand, you have a software network, no employees, no offices, no balance sheet, no CEO, and it can move a billion dollars in 10 minutes for 57 cents. The reason isn't that Bank of America is a bad bank. They're an exceptional company, an exceptional bank. The reason is that it has a different database architecture and a single database is just exponentially faster. 
And it's not just money that you can move. You can move stocks. You can move uh, any financial good. You can move mortgages. You can move loans. You can move bills. Any financial good can move over the internet at the speed of email or text. And that's the first thing you get when you get a blockchain, uh, a crypto enabled blockchain on the market. But it's, it's, it's actually not the most important thing. The, the next thing you get once you move money onto the internet is that you can actually program it like software. One of the unusual things about the financial market of today uh, is that fi finance as an industry is one of the last places where software and automation has fundamentally disrupted it. Software and automation has fundamentally disrupted retail. It's disrupted reporting. It's disrupted manufacturing. But finance hasn't been disrupted. And the reason is money hasn't existed on the internet until today. But if you think about many financial transactions, they're just if-then statements. Think about a escrow arrangement, like when you buy a house. You send the escrow agent your down payment. Uh, the person who owns the house uploads the deed. And once the mortgage is finalized, they cross that transaction and they charge you a fee. Think about a trust agreement that you might have for a child. Release this portfolio of assets to this child when they reach this age. All of these are just if-then statements. And once you move money onto the internet, you remove the need to have a centralized counterparty processing that statement. There's no reason that a trust agreement can't be processed algorithmically and with software. And there's a huge growth in this area called decentralized finance or self-driving banks, where people are using the ability to program money to replace and disrupt uh, huge parts of the financial ecosystem. And it's an extremely fast growing area. But the third thing that you do once you create a database that's available everywhere, but that isn't controlled by any single party, is you create digital property rights for the very first time. If you think about it, all a digital good is, is a string of letters and numbers. Think about your bank account. Your bank account is a string of numbers. And the reason you own your bank account is because your bank keeps a record that says this string of numbers belongs to Matt Hogan or this string of numbers belongs to you. But the problem with that is your bank is maintaining that database and they could change that database, they could alter it. Before the advent of the Bitcoin blockchain, you couldn't have digital property rights. You couldn't control a string of letters and numbers without some third party maintaining that database. Because anyone could come in and create a, a million copies of that string of letters and numbers, a million perfect copies. So you couldn't own digital goods in the same way that I own this pen, or you can own a Honus Wagner baseball card, or you can own art on your wall. I'm sure all of you have seen or heard about NFTs. You probably saw that Sotheby's auctioned a $70 million piece of digital art. You probably heard about NBA top shots with people buying the rights to own videos in the same way we used to own, own, own baseball cards. The reason we're talking about digital art now, the reason NBA top shots exist now, the reason those didn't exist five or 10 years ago is because before the advent of crypto enabled blockchains, before the advent of databases that everyone agrees is true, but no single party controls, you couldn't have digital property rights in a fundamental sense. So when people talk about Bitcoin as digital gold, part of it is that you can own Bitcoin without any third party verifying that you're the owner. You can own it in the same way, as I mentioned, that I own this pen. So a lot of people look at charts like this and they look at uh, Bitcoin and crypto uh, vastly outperforming all other asset classes. So this year, the Bitwise 10, our crypto index is up 234% through May 7th. By comparison, the S&P 500 is up 15%. Those lines at the bottom show the returns of oil, uh, S&P 500, emerging market stocks, international stocks, and gold. The lines at the top show Bitcoin and our index of the largest crypto assets. And crypto is the best performing asset class in the world this year. It was actually the best performing asset class in the world last year. Uh, our index was up 294%. It was the best performing asset class in the world in 2019. Our index was up 51%, uh, nearly 2x the return of the S&P 500. And as you go back, it's been the best performing asset class in the world uh, over long periods of time, right? It's up 5,700% almost since the start of 2017.
a lot of people talk about Bitcoin as a speculative bubble or crypto as a speculative bubble. But one thing that separates it from speculative bubbles, whether that's the Dutch East India Company in the 1600s or tulip bulbs or GameStop, is that Bitcoin and crypto has been resilient. In fact, Bitcoin has gone through uh, seven 20% plus drawdowns since 2017, including one 83% drawdown. Speculative bubbles often go up and go down and never return again. But Bitcoin has gone up and down and up and down, all on a pathway that's been significantly upwards. In fact, the price of Bitcoin's up 72.5 million percent since it started trading in 2010. And people look at these and they can't believe these type of returns. They can't imagine why this new internet currency is the best performing asset class in the world over the last one, three, five, and 10 years. And what I want you to start contextualizing the possibility that it's a technological breakthrough and that these types of technological breakthroughs are rare. If you think back to the early days of the internet, in the early days of the internet, you couldn't do much with the internet. All you could do was send files over it. We even had something called FTP. Maybe some of you remember file transfer protocol. And we would say, I'll FTP you a file. And that's all we could do over the internet. But over the last 30 plus years, we've unlocked the ability to do new things. So as an example, in 1982, we figured out how to send text over the internet. That allowed us to create email. We had AOL, CompuServe. Now we have Gmail, Hotmail, uh, and it disrupted the postal service. In 1989, we figured out how to send links over the internet. Maybe you've typed in HTTP before a web address. That's just a way of instructing the internet to allow you to send links and linked images uh, over it. That created the World Wide Web, disrupted all media, advertising, etc. In 1994, we figured out how to put encoded text in the internet. Before 1994, you couldn't put your credit card information in the internet. I remember all the warnings, never put your credit card information in the internet because it just streamed through the pipes and anyone could see your 16 digit code. In 1994, we figured out how to uh, encode that so that wouldn't be the case. And Amazon was founded in July of that year, disrupted all of, of retail. 1995, we figured out how to send voice over the internet. In 2009, we figured out how to send video over the internet. We disrupted the telecom industry and then the cable and movie industries. All Bitcoin, blockchain and crypto is, uh, if you wanna get to the root of it, is the ability to send money over the internet. Uh, and it, it allows us to send uh, any financial good over the internet. And the interesting thing about this, and the reason I think the market has gone up so much, uh, is that money is the largest addressable market that the internet has ever tackled. It's larger than, than mail, it's larger than media, it's larger even than commerce or voice or video. Money is a very large addressable market, and crypto is the way that money moves over the internet. And that's the reason the price has gone up so much uh, and, and why it's been, been so resilient. It doesn't mean that there are no risks here. There are massive risks, and we'll get into those risks in a minute. Uh, but it does mean that this is sort of a, a once in a generation technological breakthrough. Uh, and I think it's, it's worth approaching it like that. Now, I wanna spend a few, time, few minutes on, on this question. Why is there more than one crypto asset? I'm sure many of you have questions about that first part of the presentation, because we covered a lot. But I do want to I do want to get through uh, at least this next section of the presentation before we open it up for Q and A, uh, because I think there's a common misconception about this, and it builds on what I was talking about the last time. A lot of people think about different crypto assets. They hear that there are nine thousand different crypto assets out there, and they can't imagine why that would be the case. And I think the reason is they're thinking about crypto assets again as cryptocurrencies. And they're thinking about the dollar and the euro or the dollar and the pound or the pound and the yen. And they can't imagine if we have one global internet, why do we need more than one internet currency? And again, I think this idea of thinking about it exclusively as a currency is what leads people down uh, the wrong path. I want you to start thinking about it as different software companies. So different crypto assets are more like Microsoft, Slack, 
Oracle and Salesforce. Microsoft and Salesforce, they're both software companies. They're both phenomenal companies, but they're optimized to do different things. Microsoft, core office, uh, word processor, uh, Excel and PowerPoint type software. Salesforce CRM, right? Slack we use for intra-company communications. These are different companies that are optimized to do different things. Uh, they're all software companies, but they're all good at different things. And the same thing is true of different crypto assets. So these are the logos of four of the largest crypto assets. Bitcoin is that orange logo. Ethereum, which is the second largest crypto asset, is that black and gray diamond logo. Chainlink and Uniswap are two other large crypto assets. I want you to think about these as different software companies. And I'll use the, the two largest as an example. Uh, the Bitcoin blockchain was the first blockchain ever created. As a piece of software, the database that powers the Bitcoin blockchain is a very simple piece of software. Literally, when it was written, it was 350 lines of code. And you actually can't program the Bitcoin blockchain to do that much. You can only program it to send Bitcoin, receive Bitcoin, store Bitcoin, or do some very simple escrow and trust-like transactions. Ethereum is the second largest crypto asset. It looked at Bitcoin a few years after Bitcoin launched and said, wow, this is a really powerful idea. This ability to move money over the internet is a really interesting idea. What if we could program that money like we program computers? What if we could program the blockchain that powers this new currency to do anything? And so the Ethereum programming language is much more complex than the Bitcoin programming language. It's one and a half million lines of code when it launched. It's much, much more complex, much more powerful. You can program it to replace traditional lending agents. You can program it to compete with traditional stock exchanges. You can program it to serve as a capital raising platform, the same way people raise money through IPOs on the New York Stock Exchange. You can program it to do anything. Now you might be thinking, well, Matt, if Bitcoin can only be programmed to do a few things and Ethereum can be programmed to do anything, doesn't that make Bitcoin less valuable than Ethereum? And then you look at the market caps and you'd see that Bitcoin is actually three times more valuable than Ethereum. And you wouldn't maybe wonder how that would be true. Uh, and the answer is that they're, they're not better or worse. They're just good at different things. So in cybersecurity, having a limited coding language, again, Bitcoin can only be programmed to do a few things helps make your software more secure. You have a smaller attack vector. If you want to think of it very simplistically, when Bitcoin launched with those 350 lines of code, it's highly unlikely that there was a bug in 350 lines of code. People can review it very carefully. Ethereum launched with a million and a half lines of code. It's more powerful, but it's also less secure. More likely that there's a bug in there. Now, if you want to be serving as digital gold, if your primary use case is storing wealth, having a very simple programming language is probably perfect, right? The Bitcoin blockchain is optimized to be extremely secure and extremely decentralized. And the trade-off for being extremely secure and extremely decentralized is it's less functional than other blockchains. The Ethereum blockchain is, is less secure, a little bit less decentralized than Bitcoin, but vastly more functional. And so Ethereum is being used as the new rails for decentralized finance. Bitcoin is being used uh, as, as, as a digital form of gold. Just like different software companies are good at different things, different blockchains are good at different things, and they're all going after different markets. And that's why you get charts like this. This chart looks at the returns of the top 10 constituents in the Bitwise 10 large cap crypto index. These are the largest crypto assets in the world over the first quarter of 2021 alone. And what you'll see is that the difference in returns between the best and worst performing asset is nearly 400% in just the first three months. The reason these assets have such different returns is that they're going after different markets and they're optimized for different use cases. That asset at the top, Uniswap, up 448%, is going after a very specific market. It's designed for one use, which is to be a decentralized exchange. And it's found tremendous success. It's found product market fit in the same way a new software company might find product market fit and suddenly have high growth revenues. Uniswap has found product market fit. And as a result, 
its token price is going up substantially. That asset at the bottom is going after a different market. That's a variation on Bitcoin that's supposed to be more scalable. It doesn't have a lot of development activity. It doesn't have a lot of public use case. As a result, its returns have been lower. Uh, these are looking at charts like this is like looking at a chart of different software companies. You'd expect the returns to be correlated and they are, but you'd expect different pathways for different assets as they reach different markets. And that's the right way to think about Bitcoin and crypto. As you go down the list of crypto assets from one to 10,000, each one is optimized in a different way. And the market is deciding which of those approaches is going to be the most valuable. Now you're probably asking Matt, which one will win? Uh, the answer is I have no idea. It's very difficult to figure this out. Of course, this is a network effect business. The largest assets are the most liquid, most secure, have the most regulatory certainty, attract the most developers. They have advantage over new assets, but it's not necessarily the case that the largest crypto asset today will be the largest crypto asset in the future. One of the reasons we're proponents of indexing it at Bitwise is because we have a relatively high degree of confidence that crypto will be more important in the future than it is today, but we have a relatively low degree of confidence that we can pick and choose which particular assets will win over the long term. Like any disruptive market, it's not so easy, right? MySpace was, uh, was big long before Facebook even came to the market. Facebook was the 11th social networking app to launch. Uh, it's by far the largest today. My family owned a Betamax. Uh, uh, many of you probably had AOL accounts. So it's difficult to know which will win. Uh, I think I have time to cover this section and then maybe we'll open it up for Q&A. And Alec, you can, you can help moderate the Q&A. I want to talk a little bit about crypto in a portfolio setting because while the technology is neat and thinking about its applications into the world is exciting, as investors, we want to know what it does in a portfolio. And the answer there, at least historically, is that it can be a very powerful alternative asset. And that's the right way to think of it. It's an alternative asset in the same way venture capital is an alternative asset or private equity is an alternative asset. What crypto has, if you look at it from a historical returns perspective, is it combines really three things, which are actually fairly hard to find in one asset. And those three things are high potential returns, right? It's up. 5,500% since the start of 2017. I still think it, it has the potential for, for having a long way to go. Although of course, we don't know what those returns will be in the future. It has low correlations to other assets. I've posted here uh, the, the historical correlations to stocks, bonds, and gold for the Bitwise 10 index for Bitcoin and Ethereum, the two largest assets. You can see over any meaningful period of time, the correlations are about 0.1, 0.2. But the really interesting thing about crypto is usually when you look at high potential returns and low correlations, you're looking at things like early stage venture capital or private equity that locks up your capital for multiple years and where it's difficult to access the top tier managers. What makes crypto really interesting for investors is that it has those return and, and correlation characteristics, but it's liquid. It trades intraday, actually 24-7, 365, and it's accessible. In a literal sense, I own the same Bitcoin that folks like the Harvard Endowment might own in their portfolios. There is no tiering of access to this new alternative asset. And because it has high potential returns and low correlations and it's liquid, so you can rebalance your portfolio, you get really interesting portfolio characteristics when you add even a small amount of crypto to a portfolio. So what I'm showing here uh, that top line is the historical return of a 60-40, 60 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio from January 2017 to December 2020. And you can see that portfolio went up uh, about 10.6% a year. Total return was roughly 50%, and the monthly volatility was 11.6%. You can see the maximum drawdown. What we've done here is we've added one, two and a half, and five percent allocations to Bitcoin over this four-year period. Most of our clients at Bitwise have between one and 5% of their portfolio allocated to crypto. And what I would point out, let's look at that two and a half percent line is you have two really interesting characteristics here. One, even a small allocation to, to Bitcoin historically 
has had a significant impact on total return, right? It boosted the total return in this case from 50% to 76%. That's a massive impact. Uh, and it's done so without a similar increase in portfolio volatility or maximum drawdown. In this case, the monthly volatility jumped from just 11.6 to 12%, which is why the sharp ratio goes from 0.82 to 1.18. Many people think of Bitcoin as a volatile asset and crypto as a volatile asset, and it is an exceptionally volatile asset. And I expect that volatility to continue. And it has some heart-wrenching downturns, right? It went down 85% in 2018. Uh, you can see some gray hair uh, maybe as a result. But because it's liquid and because you can rebalance it, when you put it in a portfolio context, you, at, at least at constrained allocations below 5%, you don't necessarily see that full volatility piping through. In fact, historically, there's been a volatility harvesting aspect to crypto that's pretty exciting. And I'll just end with this slide. What I showed before was a point in time analysis of Bitcoin's impact on a, on a diversified portfolio. This is looking at rolling returns. So this is that same 60-40 portfolio. That's the black line on this chart. Uh, and then the green shows the contribution to Bitcoin the chart showing rolling returns. In other words, the, the point on the far left shows the return for the three years ending January 1st, 2017. The point on the far right shows the returns for the three years ending December 31st, 2020. And in between is every rolling three year period. And what you can see here is that it, actually over every period in Bitcoin's history, every three year period, adding it to a portfolio with a rebalancing tolerance has boosted both your, your cumulative and your risk adjusted returns. And even if you shorten that window to two years or one year, it still has a strong win rate, 94% of two year periods, 78% uh, of one year periods. It, it can be a powerful, at least historically has been a powerful alternative asset. Now it doesn't mean it will be in the future. We should talk about you know, the future potential returns we should talk about the significant risks that exist in this market because there are meaningful risks, but it does have these interesting portfolio characteristics of high potential returns, low correlations and liquidity. Um, Alec, before I get into what's going on in the crypto market, do we wanna pause and, and answer any questions here or, or should I just plow right ahead? Yeah, good question. Why don't we, you, we can quickly go through the market update. You know, I think it can kind of be summarized fairly quickly. And then we have some great questions um, that I'm trying to put together in kind of a sensical order uh, so we can get through them quickly. I love it. We'll keep the questions coming, guys. I'm going to give you my view on what's been happening in the crypto market. And then I'll, I'll close the slide deck and uh, and we'll be able to do some, some fun Q&A. Um, if you want to think about what's happening in the crypto market right now, why is it up 200% in the first five months of this year? Why was it up 300% this year? I think this chart is the best single chart to explain what's going on. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all recognize this chart. This is from a 1991 book by Jeffrey Moore called Crossing the Chasm. It's sort of the Bible of technology adoption in Silicon Valley. And what it says is that every technology goes through two main chunks of adoption. So first, there's the early adopter and innovator market. And I know uh, every one of you has a friend who loves the newest technology. They get the iPhone on the first day it comes out. They're probably into virtual reality. Uh, they just love early technology. And then some technologies cross the chasm to the mainstream market. What separates these two sides of the market, the early market, is acceptable to these early adopters. The products tend to have flaws or issues. And then sometimes technologies make the jump to the mainstream market. So to give you two examples, the internet started mostly at college campuses and the military. Most people outside of those settings didn't use the internet. And then we got Netscape, Google, Hotmail, and now we all are on the internet. Uh, to give you an example of a technology that doesn't cross the chasm, virtual reality has been the next big thing. It's been 18 months away for the past 18 years. And it's never crossed the chasm because when many of us put on virtual reality goggles, uh, we feel ill or we feel ridiculous or we just can't imagine wanting to be online. So some technologies make this jump, some technologies don't. 
the important thing about this slide, uh, and this is proven true of so many of uh, so many technologies historically, is the mainstream market is vastly bigger than the early adopter market. Typically, the early adopter market is about 15% of the market. What is happening in crypto right now is that as an investment, it's crossed the chasm. I used to say it's crossing the chasm, but it's crossed the chasm from something that was only used by a subset of early adopter retail investors to something that's being used by mainstream investors to gain exposure to this disruptive technology, to hedge themselves against inflationary risks, uh, and to say on, on the right side of sort of fintech and evolution. And just to, to put this into specifics, I think this process started in May of last year, uh, about a month ago, when Paul Tudor Jones uh, became the first major hedge fund investor to publicly allocate to Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation. Uh, worried about what we're witnessing right now in inflationary statistics, but worried about the impact of QE and fiscal deficit spending, looked at all the ways to hedge their ex his exposure and decided Bitcoin was the most efficient hedge against inflation. This was really the first public institutional investor embracing Bitcoin, the first sign that we were starting to cross the chasm. But since then, it's just been an absolute flood. We have S&P 500 companies like Tesla, uh, large companies like MicroStrategy and Square, buying billions of dollars of Bitcoin to house as a treasury asset uh, in their portfolios. We have Wall Street banks that historically dismissed crypto as a ridiculous idea. JP Morgan CEO famously said, Bitcoin's a fraud and worse than tulip bulbs. It won't end well. Someone is going to get killed. Actually threatened to fire any employee who bought Bitcoin because he thought it was so ridiculous. Today, JP Morgan is offering Bitcoin exposure to its clients uh, and their flagship research report says it could compete with gold <coughs> and has significant upside. Not just JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Alliance Bernstein, Guggenheim, Goldman Sachs, uh, you name it, all of them have come around to embracing crypto. Also large asset managers, BlackRock CIO here in November saying Bitcoin could replace gold to a large extent. To contextualize that, uh, Rick Reeder, the CIO, is the, is the CIO for a $7 trillion asset manager. Were Bitcoin to have the same valuation as gold, every Bitcoin would be worth about half a million dollars. Uh, so this is a big statement coming from the CIO of the largest asset manager in the world. And not just Wall Street and, and corporations and hedge funds, but major financial technology firms, PayPal, made purchasing Bitcoin and crypto available uh, to 200 million Americans uh, through their app. Visa is looking into settling digital currency. Uh, individual investors are still allocating to crypto. Financial advisors are increasingly allocating. We do a survey every year in January, we publish it uh, about what percentage of advisors are allocating to crypto and client portfolios. In January, 2020, that was 6%. In January 2021, it was 9% out of 1,000 advisors we surveyed. Uh, and an additional 8% uh, uh, planned to allocate in the next 12 months. Uh, and I think we're running well, well ahead of that. And of course, even major wirehouses uh, are now helping their clients allocate to crypto. As I mentioned, there's still significant risks. And I really hope you ask me about these risks in the Q&A. They're regulatory risks particularly around areas of the market like DeFi, uh, their adoption risks, their technology risks. These are fundamentally software programs. They could still have software issues. Their competitive risks from central bank digital currencies and their behavioral risks for investors. These are very volatile assets. So they can be hard for investors to hold through the uh, stomach wrenching ups and downs. But I do think this is a market that's arrived. It's a market you can't ignore. It's a market that's now a multi-trillion dollar market that's available for investment at, at most major uh, wirehouses and banks to at least a select number of clients. And we're on a, a pathway to this becoming more and more important in the future. So really appreciate you guys listening to me. I'm gonna go through, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end the presentation here and we'll open it up for Q&A. Awesome, well, well, thank you, Matt. And, and thank you again, Kathy, for, for having us on. and. Uh, for those of you who I haven't spoken with before, I'm the business development officer working uh, with our advisor and investment professional clients uh, in the Atlanta area and throughout the Southeast. Uh, so really happy to get a chance to, 
to speak with you all and, and have you here from Matt. Um, thank you to everyone that submitted questions. We're not gonna be able to get through all of them, uh, but I'm, I'm noting them down so I can get back to you with answers uh, if we can't answer them live here. Uh, but definitely we have some overlap between questions. Um, so Matt, you know, I guess the, the first one that the people are asking about is if you could, you know, at a high level, because this is a conversation we could probably have for another 45 minutes, um, but can you explain the concept of mining and, and how that helps to secure, you know, the network if we want to talk about this in a, in, as it relates to Bitcoin? I love it. We could have this conversation for a day, Alec. Uh, this is something I love. If you think about what a bank does, that's the best way to think about it. Uh, banks do two things. They keep your deposits safe and they process transactions, right? If I want to send money to you, Alec, the bank will process that transaction. Uh, Bitcoin miners do the same thing. But instead of being one centralized bank, it's say 100,000 different computers scattered around the world, uh, right? And they're all competing with one another to process blocks of transactions. Uh, and when one miner wins this competition, they get to settle a group of transactions and they're paid in Bitcoin, right? So that's, that's generally the role. They play the same role that banks play in the traditional financial system. That role is played by, by miners in the decentralized financial system. The way it secures the network, um, one thing you can, maybe I'll answer this. The one way you could defraud a blockchain is if you could determine, uh, or you could fraudulently settle transactions, let's put it that way, right? And you could, you could do that over a period of time and you could spirit the assets away before anyone noticed. The, the reason having all these 100,000 computers competing, burning energy, uh, trying to solve complex mathematical puzzles is it effectively randomizes who's going to settle the next group of transactions. Uh, and it randomizes it and it raises the cost to participate in that guessing game. Uh, and as a result, uh, it makes it so that if you wanted to defraud the network, you'd effectively have to uh, expend more energy than 50% of all the miners around the world. And this is the largest supercomputing network in the world. It would be economically unfeasible. It would be technologically unfeasible. It's why it's the most secure database in the world. So you can think of it as that, the money that people spend mining Bitcoin, the energy that they burn mining Bitcoin is like a, a, a protective wall. And the more energy people spend, the more money people spend, the higher intruders would have to climb to disrupt the system. And right now that wall stretches like to the moon. I mean, it is, it is by far and away the largest um, a supercomputing network in the world, it, it would be very difficult to, to break it in this sense. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have a, a question here on resources available. Um, and so I will make sure to send Kathy, who can forward out to the group, this slide deck. I believe there will be a replay because there's a recording of this, um, as well as the CFA Institute's research brief. So I'll make sure you get the, the most relevant materials, because I think from, from our standpoint, being a partner in education is important, for, especially for any advisors, for anyone that's managing money for others. Uh, definitely want you to feel like you're, you're supported if, uh, if it's something that clients are asking about or if you want to begin asking to clients or offering to clients, excuse me. Um, Matt, another, group, another line of questioning that came up a couple times is the question of regulation, right? Um, so what, what regulations have, or regulatory actions have been put in place already? Is there anything that keeps you up at night? Um, and I know that Ray Dalio famously said that he thinks governments might ban cryptos. Um, you might say it's tough to disagree with Ray Dalio Ray Dalio might say it's tough to disagree with Matt Hogan. So why the disagreement there? <laughs> I love that. Uh, I'll say on regulation, you know, first of all, there's a generalized disconnect between reg where regulation is and where people imagine it in their mind. There are a lot of people who are anchored on crypto in 2013 and think it's largely an unregulated space. Those of us who are in the crypto industry know that that's no longer the case, right? The, 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 the travel rule applies to crypto exchanges. Uh, crypto is regulated by the CFTC, it's regulated by the SEC, it's regulated by the OCC. Uh, if you string three letter acronyms together, they're probably regulating crypto in one way or the other. 
I think when I got into the crypto market professionally uh, in 2017, 2018, there were still a number of binary regulatory risks where I thought major regulatory decisions could significantly set back the crypto industry. Uh, examples of that are whether traditional AML KYC would be applied to crypto exchanges, uh, whether crypto assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum would be deemed to be securities. Without AML KYC, I didn't see a robust institutional future for crypto. And if Bitcoin and, and ETH had been deemed securities, the liquidity is ecosystem would have collapsed. Um, we surmounted both of those and a few more. And so now it's in a, at least for large cap crypto assets, it's in a relatively robust state. And you know that's true because BlackRock is allocating and Mass Mutual is allocating and Morgan Stanley is letting their clients allocate. They wouldn't be doing this if this we're still so far outside the regulatory pale. Now there are regulatory risks. Uh, one I worry about, and then the Ray Dalio one, which I don't worry about. The one I worry about in the decentralized finance space, particularly, I think um, uh, there's some big regulatory questions and depending on how they're answered, it could either be a massive disruption to traditional financial uh, services, or it could be set back five to 10 years. And those questions are live in the market right now. So, so I think that's real. The government is going to have a hard time banning Bitcoin. There's no precedent in the US for the government doing such a thing. The government seized gold from US citizens in the 30s as a way of conducting QE, but there's no precedent for just deciding something is wrong to own. I just don't think they can put that genie back in the bottle. And it's also the case that crypto is one of the fastest growing economic sectors uh, in the world right now. And I don't think the US wants to export that to, to China, Switzerland and other venues. Uh, I think they want it to grow in house. So I think you'll see positive progressive regulation for the most part. Awesome, thank you. Uh, another couple of questions that have come through are about another risk. Um, and something that, that people might worry about is the risk of quantum computing. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, is that something that you worry about? It's not something I worry about, but here's what I'll say. You know how I said that we're building this wall of mining activity? Uh, the questioner is right in that, um, you know, quantum computing would leap that wall, like, like Superman in a single bound, right? That's the risk. Uh, the reason I don't worry about it, the reason it would leap that wall, it would break traditional cryptography. Um, the reason I don't worry about it is the same cryptography that underlies the Bitcoin blockchain and other blockchains also underlies all military communications, all point of sale transactions and the public internet among many other things in our society. So we're quantum computing to develop exponentially from where it is today to be able to leap this cryptographic wall. There'd be no secure government communications. The internet would go down and we couldn't be able to buy things at any stores. I love crypto, but it wouldn't be my first concern. Uh, because all of those things rest on the same core cryptography, I'm confident that the efforts going underway to create quantum resistant cryptography will ultimately succeed. Uh, and in fact, people have made a lot of progress there. So it's good to keep it in mind. Like if we woke up tomorrow and there was a massive steady state quantum computing, yes, it would break. But so would so many huge chunks of the world that I just don't, I just don't think it's going to happen. Makes sense. Um, we have a question here about how and when to access investments um, through traditional brokerage accounts and, and 401k vehicles. Um, so, you know, like Matt mentioned at the beginning of the call, we do have a, a couple of funds available today that can be bought and sold in, in those traditional accounts under tickers BITW uh, and BITQ. Uh, would definitely love to, to connect with you to, to speak about them. Um, cause there's, you know, intricacies to each. And, and, uh, like we said with BITW, it can, it can trade kind of like a closed end fund, almost trading to premiums and discounts. Um, but there are some vehicles today that allow you to get that crypto exposure. Um, and then it looks like we got about five more minutes here and, and plenty of questions. Um, so another one here is, is asking about corporations putting it on their balance sheets. Um, 
you know, the question was, why haven't we seen it as much in, in Q1 of, of 2021? I think there actually might have been a, a couple companies that did go ahead and add it. Do you, do you happen to remember who those were? Uh, there were a number of companies, uh, particularly overseas. Uh, so there, there's, a, there's a major company in Japan that added $100 million. There was a, a few companies in Europe that added it. Um, and we continue to see it in the U.S. You know, I suspect it's a trend that will accelerate throughout this year. There are a number of other uh, large companies. Uh, Palantir was talking yesterday that they're evaluating out of Bitcoin to their, their, their treasury asset. Um, you know, it is a very volatile asset. So it's a real statement and a step still to add it. But um, I do think it's a trend that will persist. Perfect. Um, and, and speaking of materials that I can send as a follow-up, uh, Matt has a great catalog of articles that he wrote for Forbes. Uh, one of them on the topic of taxation, which came up a couple of times in Q&A. Um, Matt, I know neither of us are, are licensed tax advisors, but at a high level, could you talk about how crypto assets are taxed? Absolutely. I, and I would just add, for those of you who want to track corporate holdings of crypto, uh, there's a website called BitcoinTreasuries.org uh, that does a fantastic job. And there are probably 40 companies on there that have significant holdings of, of Bitcoin, you know, starting from MicroStrategy with $5 billion to Tesla with $2.4 billion uh, and on down, down the list. Uh, the taxation of crypto largely is simple. First of all, uh, if you buy a crypto asset and sell it at a higher price, you owe taxes. This is not a world where taxes have disappeared. Uh, so you do owe taxes on your crypto assets. Crypto is taxed as property which is largely means it's taxed like stocks. If you hold for longer than a year, you own long-term capital gains. If you hold for shorter than a year, you own short-term capital gains. There are some areas of uncertainty in crypto taxation, particularly around hard forks. Uh, that's an area where the IRS is working on additional clarity. Um, but by and large, it's pretty simple. It's pretty much taxed like stock. One of the reasons uh, people love working with fund companies, Bitwise is an example, but there are others, is that it makes crypto taxation very simple. You get a simple K1 or a 1099 uh, that gives you one line item to fit into your tax reporting status. So it does make it very simple. And uh, I don't think there's as much real confusion around crypto taxation as there is uh, imagined confusion uh, and, and confused reporting. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I can say from from personal experience that uh, crypto taxes filing is uh, is not fun, and the fund route is is definitely the easier way to go. Um, I know one of the things we touched on was thinking about different crypto assets as different softwares that are optimized to do different things. You know, with the the eight or nine or ten thousand crypto assets out there today, um, do you have a view on? on you know, how many or, or how significant the, the winners and losers will be. Um, and you know, I guess kind of a, a tag along question to how many winners there might be is you know, with, with NFTs, is that, is that real feasible technology that you think has a future? Yeah, I think you should expect the same sort of power law distribution you get in software companies as you get in crypto which are, there are a handful of really, really, really important software companies. And then my uncle has, you know, a software company with two employees and you'll, you'll have the same thing in crypto. Most of those 9,000 assets are worth nothing. I suspect 10 years from now, the vast majority of the market capitalization in the crypto space will be in the top 10, 20 assets, maybe even in the top five. Uh, I do expect there'll be some assets that don't exist today that become institutionally important. A major new crypto asset called uh, Internet Computer, uh, otherwise known as Definity, launched earlier this week, is now trading worth $50 billion. Very interesting asset. Um, but that's my answer. You know, 20, 10, 5, something in that vein um, is, is, is what I would expect. NFTs, NFTs are both goofy and ridiculous and representative of an extremely powerful fact about crypto. So here's why they're goofy. Someone paid $70, for, $70 million for a JPEG. 
Uh, people are paying millions of dollars for these pixelized images of, of crypto punks. People are paying $250,000 for uh, videos of John Morant dunking on end of bench guys that they could watch on Twitter for free. These are all insane in the same way that paying $150,000 for a banana duct taped to a door at, at, at Art Basel was insane. Uh, people do crazy things. But, but here's, here's what's interesting about it. What's interesting about NFTs is that they prove, as I mentioned earlier, that digital property rights can exist, right? NFTs couldn't have existed before crypto because you didn't have digital property rights. And if you just let your mind cogitate on what digital property rights could mean, you realize that it's a almost a generational idea. We all live in an increasingly digital world. The ability to have real digital property rights is an absolute game changer. And NFTs are just the really goofy tip of the spear uh, that's proving that that's, that's true. Awesome. Well, well, thank you, Matt, for, for taking all those questions. If I didn't get to your question, uh, I did uh, note them down and we'll, we'll get back to you individually. Uh, if you have any more that you want to send our way, my email is alec, A-L-E-C, at bitwiseinvestments.com. Uh, so please feel free to reach out. Uh, and with that, Kathy, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Gentlemen, that was great. And thank you, Matt, for an incisive presentation. Thanks to everybody who uh, joined us today and look for an event survey to include the replay and meeting presentation to follow. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all. You as well.